we are looking at the first two verses of the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. So Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Let's hear God's word. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's God's word. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you spoke this word, that you inspired Paul to write it and that you carried him along by your spirit, revealing to him the unsearchable riches in, that are in Christ Jesus and the mysteries that had been until then hidden from us. We thank you that you've made them real. You've opened our eyes to see that truth. You revealed yourself in the face of Christ. And we thank you that we can read, we can hear, and we can learn from you through your word by the Spirit. We pray that you would open our minds, open our hearts, and open our wills to believe, to love, and to do your word as it's written by Paul here. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. January 2009. How old were you? I was 24. It was 12 years ago. And we were sat in the Harrier building just after the new year. And we were starting a sermon series on Ephesians. And Eric, as I said last week, Eric introduced us to two phrases which I hope have stuck with us. I think it goes something like this. It changes every time we say it, doesn't it? <laughs> God loves us more than we can ever imagine and we're more, more sinful than we realize. And those two truths go together right through all the Bible, but through Ephesians particularly. And this greeting of Paul in the first two verses, as I looked at it, I realized it sets the stage for everything Paul's about to say. Now you could say that with any letter, but as I looked at it, I realized more and more that that's what was happening. So your three points today are God's sovereignty, sainthood, I suppose, sainthood, and grace. God's sovereignty, sainthood, and grace. So point one, God's sovereignty. Paul introduced himself, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. By the will of God. Paul had had a dramatic conversion to the Christian faith. Indeed, it's one of, I think, the great evidences of the truth of the New Testament is the life of Paul. Paul, as you can read in the book of Acts, is a Jewish religious leader that wants to destroy Christianity. And the book of Acts says he breathes out threats to the church. He gets, he, he agrees, he sanctions the death of the first Christian martyr in Acts chapter 7, Stephen. He gets letters and approval to go out and hunt Christians down and to bring them before the synagogues. Because to Paul, they're traitors. They've abandoned the faith. They've turned their back on the God of Israel by worshipping Jesus of Nazareth. And then... One day, he's converted on a road to Damascus. So dramatic is his conversion, as you remember, we, he goes into detail in Galatians 1 and 2 when we were looking at it there. So dramatic was his conversion, the church was scared. You can read about it in Acts. Ananias, God tells him to go and meet Saul, as Paul was called. And he said, he persecuted us. You know, it's like, I'm not going. Think of what he could do to me. And the church was astonished. They said, this was the man who was persecuting us. 
and even his friends. Now, if you've ever changed your mind on something, whether it's religion, whether it's politics, any opinion you've held for however long, changing your mind takes a lot of courage. I, I respect anybody that comes out and says, yep, I was wrong. Because we make any excuse in the world not to admit that we're wrong. You know, we, we, we read something wrong on the shopping list, it takes us all our time to admit we got it wrong. But something as deeply held as a religious belief, to change that takes something quite incredible. And Paul had that quite incredible experience of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only was he a Christian, he was an apostle. And again, we went through this in Galatians. Apostle means sent one. The, the apostles have a very special place in Christian history. A special, so special actually, it's unique. In Ephesians 2, when we get to it, we'll talk about it more. But it was, for the, fa it was the founding of the Christian church. The apostles and prophets were for the founding of the Christian church. Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. And I, I believe when that, when that foundation was laid, when the scriptures were completed, those ministries ceased. There are no apostles today. There might be missionaries, there might be church planters, but the ministry of the apostles was for the early church. They were those who were to prepare the ground to get the church ready. And for 2000 years, God's been building his church on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. So Paul was a sent one to proclaim Christ Jesus among the nations. He was actually, as you may remember, the apostle to the Gentiles, whereas Peter was the apostle to the Jewish people. But the, the last phrase of the, that part of the verse is where we talk about the sovereignty of God, by the will of God by the will of God. As we sang in that song, who, um, who called me out before my birth, Paul says that, I was set apart before I was born to this ministry. God called me to it. Indeed, so dramatic it was, it couldn't have been any other way. God was the one who called him to risk his life for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because everything he was doing to Christians, they would do to him. Or well, they would try to do to him. Because now he was a sellout. And as, as you know, when you, again, when you change your mind on an issue, as Paul did, you lose a lot of friends, you lose, or your, your friendships aren't the same anymore. And Paul lost more or less everything. And it was by the will of God, God's sovereign call on Paul's life to make him an apostle and to send him to the Gentiles, the, the non-Jewish peoples. God chose that task for him. And the only reason Paul said yes to it was because God chose him and God worked in him first. You know, we, we remember when we looked at that passage um, in Acts chapter 16, Lydia, her heart was opened to understand the word. God had to do what God, to become a Christian, to become called by God to anything, God has to be first. God calls us. God loves us. God clings to us, so we cling to him, so we follow him, and we love him in return. Paul is an apostle by the will of God. It's all of God from start to finish. And we will get, it, as I say, we will get into all this, especially in the next few weeks, where Paul really labors this point in Ephesians chapter one, that God is sovereign. We were chosen before the foundation of the world. We were predestined. Before we were born, God chose us. So the same God who chose Paul is the same God who chose you. Point two, saints, sainthood. 
Paul writes, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Saint means set apart or one who is set apart. Be the first time that phrase, not saint, but the set apart, the other word for it in the Bible, excuse me, is sanctified. And the first time it's ever used in the Bible is in Genesis 2. God blesses the seventh day and he sets it apart or he sanctifies it or he makes it holy. That day, especially among the seven, is God's for holy use. You know, there were holy tables, there were holy items, they were just cups, just robes, but they were set apart by God for a task. And that's what the Christian is. The Christian is a saint, one who is set apart, one who is sanctified. And we're sanctified in two ways, who we are in Christ and who we are in ourselves. We're set apart in Christ, who is completely holy, because he lived the perfect life. And so when God looks at you, he looks at someone who is completely holy because you're in Christ. And the second way that he makes us holy is what we call gradual sanctification or gradual holiness. We're made more and more holy over our life as a Christian. And now we all know by bitter experience sometimes we're up and down sometimes we are so close to God the slightest sin grieves us terribly and sometimes we're backslidden and we can do things that a few months before we would never dreamt of doing but a true Christian is faithful indeed when a true Christian is backslidden they'll feel that they'll know that God just won't leave them to it they'll know that I'm not where I should be I'm not where I was a few months ago I haven't been reading my Bible as much I haven't been praying I'm grumpy and I'm miserable more than I was when I was close to God I don't care about church I should do something about this and even if we feel that for a long time we're still feeling it because that's God calling us back to him. If you're a true Christian, you can't escape him. He will call you back because as we've said, it's all of him. It's all of his sovereignty from start to finish. But a true Christian is faithful. A true Christian is faithful. So a Christian is kept by the power of God, walking in his ways, and when we do backslide God calls us back and th those who are faithful are faithful in Christ Jesus in Christ Jesus that's the that's what we call union with Christ and that too is developed in this book we'll get to it um, Ephesians chapter 5 Paul talks about the union of Christ and the church as in a marriage and that's the perfect illustration so all the the reason we're saints as I've said the reason we're set apart the reason we're considered completely holy is because we're united to Christ we are united to God John Calvin said that was the greatest blessing a Christian could ever have because it was the doorway into all the other blessings forgiveness of sin right standing with God, adoption into God's family, a new heart, the Holy Spirit indwelling in us, the hope of eternal life, all that, all that we have because we're united to Christ. And because before God, he is the perfect one. He is the one who kept the law perfectly. He's the one who bore its curse. He's the one who loved God and loved his neighbor. So like a marriage, when you get married, what's theirs becomes yours, and what's yours becomes theirs. Our sin he bore on the cross, and all the blessings that he deserved are poured on our unworthy souls. In Christ Jesus, 
We're set apart, we're forgiven, we're righteous, we're holy, we're called, and we're kept because we're in Christ Jesus forever. That's what it means to be a saint. It means to be in Christ, set apart in Christ, and gradually over our lifetime, becoming more like him. And the third point, grace. You'll hear this word too a lot when we, as we go through Ephesians. Gr- grace, you, you could just write, the ho- what, what's the point, what's the main theme of Galatians? You could write grace. Just one word. It's commonly said by Christians that grace means God's riches at Christ's expense. Paul greets the Ephesians with grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace, it means God's undeserved favour. We can't earn it, we don't deserve it, but God gives it to us by his own sovereign will. And that'll be explained more next week. God, in his sovereign choice, is what we call sovereign prerogative, his choice, before the foundation of the world, chose to show grace and favour to those who didn't deserve it. And when God brings us to faith in Christ, what do we have? Romans 5.1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit gives us peace in our hearts. So God's undeserved favour, his unmerited blessing and kindness and peace with him and peace of conscience and peace in our hearts are all ours by the sovereign will of God and we get it because of Christ Jesus because he bore our sins and we go free in his righteousness and we're adopted in his sonship is ours that's why he could say in John's gospel he called God my God and your and their God, my Father, and their Father. All of that is ours by faith. We also see here, not got time to dwell on this for too long, but we see God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That, a hint at the Trinity there, that there's two persons, God the Father and God the Son, who are one being from everlasting to everlasting. And indeed, that will come right through through all this. The next, the whole chapter of Ephesians 1 is saturated in the grace, the compassion, the mercy, the glory of the triune God. And all the blessings that will be described to you are yours by faith because you're in Christ. Indeed, that's, Trevor used to say it, how, what is it that Christians are called most in the Bible? in Christ, in him. In, you'll see that all the way through this chapter. We are in Christ. Everything we have, everything we are is because we are in Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's all rising from the grace of God, God's undeserved favor. Everything we have, we have because of Christ, because we didn't deserve it. We couldn't earn it. God just showed his grace because he wanted to. There's nothing in us that made us made God think, oh, they've been good. I better show them grace. No, it was purely of his own sovereign free will that he gave it to us. So what are we going to do with this? Well, the sovereignty of God is always difficult it always has been and it's even harder for us today because what it says is we looked at the power of God we looked at God's absolute authority over everything we westerners in 2021 don't like the idea of government having absolute power quite rightly um, human history is a horror story of governments that had absolute power and when we think of God 
having absolute power, that makes, it's always made human beings uncomfortable, but there's something especially so for us because of our culture and our context, but we believe it. We believe that we're in the hands of an all good God who loves us and even, right, even when we can't understand, because there's a lot we can't understand, isn't there? Um, just glance, I glanced at the Sky News app today and I just thought, oh my, what happened in Plymouth? Haiti has had another earthquake. The Taliban are going into Kabul as we speak and the Afghan government is handing over power peacefully nearly 20 years after the, and it's 20 years next month since the event that started all that happened, 9-11. We're still in a COVID crisis. God's sovereign. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I find it hard to work out too. Um, and I've no easy, quick answer to why all this is happening. But we follow a savior who was a man of sorrows, who knew hardship, who trusted God, especially on the dark days. Think of the darkest day in his life when he was in the garden. He could say, your will be done. Um, so we trust in our sovereign God even when times are hard. Even when times are hard. We must, second point, we must treasure, think about, believe in our union with Jesus Christ. When was that, I mean, somebody asked me this and he said, when was the last time you sat and thought about it for five minutes in a chair that I'm united to Jesus Christ? And I, I, I thought, the last time I did it? Hmm, I don't know. <laughs> I think when I prepared for the sermon in December of last year, when I looked at Union with Christ. But what's interesting, we mentioned about the Keswick Convention. Some of us went in 2018, and it was like a new topic. I bought a few books on it. People were saying, oh, we need to talk about this a bit more. And it's so true, because every other blessing depends on this one, being united to Jesus Christ. And basically, it's one, it's one way of saying, having faith in Jesus Christ. The Spirit unites us to Christ, and we have faith in him. It's God's work in us. And we must treasure that, because the days are hard. The days are dark, as we've just said. And we can run the race with endurance Look into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And the third point is be faithful. Be faithful. So get close to Jesus Christ. Um, if, you are not, if you're not reading the Bible, start, please. Read as little or as much as you feel you can. Why not start with Ephesians? Why not just read a few verses of Ephesians every day and work your way through the book? so that you know something of it. And pray, pray, thank God for what you've learned in his word and ask him to put it into practice. And indeed, we have plenty of meetings. Come to one of them. If you don't want to, just get in touch. One of us will maybe meet up if we feel we can and talk about things. But fellowship with other Christians, the, 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 the disciplines that the Christian has is the word, the prayer, and the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Um, so get into the word, hear it, sing it, pray it, do it. Spend time in prayer to God, just talk to him. Tell him what's on your mind. You're fed up of everything, well tell him. You've, I talked about backsliders. You, you, you're backslidden and you don't feel like you even want to pray. Well, pray and tell him that. God delights in truth in the inward being. 
Psalm 51, verse 6. Be honest with him. And ask him to make you more holy, to desire and hunger and thirst for righteousness. And the last point. Remember the grace of God. Remember the grace of God. The 500 years ago, the idea that God saves us by grace alone went like wildfire through our continent and around the world. The idea that we couldn't save ourselves, that we, are, we depend entirely on the grace of God revolutionized and opened people's eyes to the wonder and the glory, the majesty, the tenderness of our God in Christ Jesus. So, be grace-minded people. Remember, every day of your life, you stand before God as his child by his grace, not by your performance. Even if you've had a bad day, even if you've had a good day, you know, a really good day, you've been a super Christian, even then, you're only accepted by God because of his grace. And as the old hymn says, "'Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead us home." As the chorus to that beautiful song said, grace unmeasured, fast and free, that's the first line, grace paid for my sins and brought me to life, grace clothes me with power to do what is right, Grace will lead me to heaven where I'll see your face and never cease to thank you for your grace. Amen. Let's pray. O oh God of grace, you are sovereign. You are sovereign in all the worlds you've made. You are sovereign in all the, all the affairs of humanity. And your sovereign, you are the Lord of human pain. You turn, you work in all things to bring about your glory. And we thank you that you called us in Christ Jesus, that you set us apart in him, that you've given us the spirit to walk by his power, and that you've given us grace and peace. We thank you for these blessings, O oh Lord, in Christ Jesus. And we thank you that whatever happens in these dark days, we have a hope that's so sure, that's an anchor for our souls. We have a Savior in heaven pleading for us. And he will bring us safely to Jordan's shores where we will gaze on him forever. Make these things true in our hearts and in our minds. And may they cause us to walk in your ways, to be faithful and holy, humble, kind and rejoicing as we go on our way from here. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.